Right. Thank you. Justin. I'd like to thank uh, Hans and Elton for inviting uh, me graciously and giving me the best time of my life so far. Um, I'm talking today about the Ron Paul phenomenon and its response in the United States. Now, the Ron Paul phenomenon, and it is a phenomenon, an unprecedented event in the history of our movement, is an ideological touchstone. Tell me your response to the rise of such an unlikely icon, and I'll tell you what and where you are politically and culturally. It is often said by bewildered commentators, Christopher Caldwell comes to mind, that Paul is a kind of workshop test. His supporters project onto him the ideas they hold dear. This is what supposedly explains his appeal to a wide variety of folks, from blue state anti war activists to redneck Second Amendment activists. However, the real secret of Ron Paul's success is that he managed to project onto his audience the full, untrammeled vision of liberty, wrapped in a trenchant critique of where he went wrong and how we can get out of it. The problem, in Paul's view, is that we are in the grip of a militaristic corporate state with a seized state power that is now lording over the rest of us. The system contains Paul. Rest on an inherent contradiction. That between a constitutional system of limited government and a world empire on which the sun never sets. A republic or an empire? Which shall it be? If your answer is the former, then Paul was your natural choice for president. And an awful lot of people from wildly diverse backgrounds and orientations made that choice this year, more than any other libertarian candidate in the history of our movement. And, incredible as it may seem, the response to this inside movement was not universally favorable. To get an understanding of why, however, it is necessary to go back in time and review the history of the organized libertarian movement in the United States, starting around 1978. At that time, Murray and Rothbard, the premier libertarian theorists, and the, own, and, and the ideological lone star of the movement was affiliated with the Cato Institute, which was then based in San Francisco. And this was the center of a vital and growing movement. This mighty ideological center was made possible by the largesse of Charles G. Koch, an heir to the Koch family fortune and Koch Industries, the largest privately owned company in the U.S. The father, Fred C. Koch, had made his money in oil, engineering, and cattle, and they owned the state of Kansas, for as far as I know. Uh, he passed on his fortune to his sons, at least two of whom, Charles and David, shared his libertarian beliefs. Now, from the outside looking in, all was well. Magazine and newspaper articles hailed libertarianism as the next big thing and profiles of the Institute and its spin-off groups were published in the mainstream media and glowed with admiration for their organization and enthusiasm, if not praise for their ideas. In the, in the mid-1970s, when Charles Koch contacted Rothbard about what he could do to advance the movement's goals, the late great libertarian theorist wrote a long memo that projected the creation of a mighty apparatus of libertarian cadre organizing in virtually every arena of American political and intellectual life. Cole had the money and Rothbard had the vision. At the core of it all was Rothbard's conception of the Cato Institute, which, by the way, was a name he came up with, as a think tank devoted to the development, spread, and popularization of the Austrian School of Economics, free market solutions to social problems on the home front and a devotion to the preservation and expansion of civil liberties, as well as a consistent opposition to U.S. imperialism. This last theme was particularly important as far as Rothbard was concerned. It was the linchpin of his political stance as basically an old rightist, but as a survivor of a time when the right side of the political spectrum in the U.S. 
was anti-conventionist, and it was the left that was calling for the jailing of anti-war protesters for sedition. Rothbard saw war as the progenitor of the collectivist revolution in America. An opposition to American historic policy of global intervention was, for Rothbard, necessarily the main focus of libertarians in the 20th century, the era of two world wars and dozens of lesser armed conflicts, all of which led to the rise of what he called the welfare and warfare state. One of Rothbard's many and major contributions to the growth and development of the organized libertarian movement in America was that he carried the anti conventionist tradition of the 1930s and 1940s into the contemporary political scene, weighing the old banner of the America First Committee and weighing the intellectual groundwork for the emergence of the Ron Paul phenomenon more than a decade after his death. Now, growing up alongside a co funded Cato Institute like Mushrooms in the Shade of a Giant Tree, a whole network of special interest groups and periodicals sprouted. There was a student group, a movement magazine, Libertarian Review, uh, a weekly outreach to liberals magazine called Inquiry. Uh, these satellite organizations were all housed across the street from the glass steel tower of the Cato Institute. Uh, in an unassuming warehouse. Now, the split between Rothbard and the Institute, he had inspired and essentially founded, was occasioned by the presidential campaign in 1980, in which, which Rothbard was most unhappy with. In an incident that has become legendary in libertarian circles, the party's candidate, Edward Clark, an oil company lawyer, went on national television to explain to interviewer Ted Koppel that libertarianism was basically just, quote, low-tax liberalism, end quote. This outraged Rothbard for any number of very good reasons, not the least of which was its strategic wrong-headedness. The Cato Institute's strategy was to target the elites, especially in the media, but also in the two major political parties and in government circles. Rothbard, on the other hand, took the diametrically opposite view he envisioned a populist revolt against the elites who profit from the maintenance and growth of state power. Libertarians, he believed, must make their appeal to ordinary people instead of aspiring to a position at court in the hope of withering advice in the king's ear. It is necessary to appeal to the great masses of Americans so that libertarianism will become a living and vital political movement and not just an intellectual parlor game. Now, when Clark, under the tutelage of the Cato High Command, refused to come out for the abolition of the income tax on the grounds that this constituted an unacceptable radicalism, Rothbard essentially broke with Cato, although the formal divorce didn't come until a bit later. Rothbard attacked the Clark campaign in a series of articles that mocked the campaign's timidity in its rather pathetic appeal to the narrow interests of low tax liberals of a certain class and age. Rothbard's erstwhile followers in the Cato group made their appeal to influential supporters who must be kept blissfully ignorant of the more controversial aspects of libertarian theory. This was symbolized by their move to Washington where they built themselves another glass and steel headquarters, only much bigger this time, and set up shop as resident libertarians in the corridors of power. Rothbard, on the other hand, pursued the path of populism. He insisted that libertarian political action must be directed at the majority of the American people and not tailored to the, uh, the cultural prejudices and ideological idiosyncrasies of New York Times reading white wine and free liberals. Rothbard and Cato went their separate ways, and so did the two ways. One has been in Washington, and another concentrated in different ways, especially the West, way of white populism was being rise up, and others were ready to lose the way of action of liberal effort in Washington, the way of Washington, the adopted itself to its surroundings with chameleon like instincts, while Rothbard and his supporters organized in the countryside, so to speak planning a guerrilla insurgency and cultivating conservatives who were beginning to resent the incursion of the neoconservatives, that is, invaders from the left, 
and the effective takeover of the official conservative movement by former leftists and right-wing social democrats. The rock bar Cato Swift has thundered the libertarian movement to this day. And that was certainly underscored by the response of the Beltway libertarians to the unprecedented success of the whole campaign. As the good doctor began to garner a fair share of media attention and his poll numbers began to rise, the Beltway crowd sneered that he was too old fashioned, too culturally conservative, and not likely to make any headway. Well, when he did make headway, and was addressing crowds of many thousands at rallies across the country. And the record campaign contributions began to get the campaign notice. The Beltway crowd, most notably the editors and writers at Reason Magazine, a co funded enterprise, began to back off and offer their reluctance, although still condescending, support, but not for long. The Coke machine was merely revving up its motors for a smear campaign of unparalleled viciousness. Just as the poll campaign was beginning to break through the wall of silence and liberal media bias, the new Republic magazine came out with a piece by one Jamie Kirchick, a 25-year-old punk, uh, <laughs> and accused the poll campaign and brought himself of appealing to a thinly disguised racism. In particular, the target of Kirchick's scrutiny was a series of Ron Paul political newsletters written in the early 1990s that violated the canons of political correctness as much for the style in which they were written uh, as for their contents. The reason, the, the reason magazine crowd immediately took up the cry of racism and devoted endless articles, and I do mean endless, to the ensuing controversy as the Beltway libertarian crowd gleefully prepared for the righteous purge. Writing in the online edition of Reason Magazine, David Weigel and uh, Julian Sanchez, the latter of the Cato Institute, claimed that the whole episode was rooted in the strategy enunciated by the late Maria Rothbard and Lou Rockwell, founder and president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, designed to appeal to those dreaded right-wing populists, and I quote, during the period when the most incendiary items appeared, roughly 1989 to 1994, Rockwell, the prominent libertarian theorist Murray Rothbard, championed an open strategy of exploiting racial and class resentment to build a coalition with populist paleoconservatives producing a flurry of articles and manifestos whose racially charged talking points and vocabulary mirrored the controversial poll newsletters recently unearthed by the New Republic. Uh, the most detailed description of the strategy came in an essay Rothbard wrote for, for the Rothbard Rockwell Report titled Writing Populism Strategy for the Paleo Movement. Lamenting that mainstream intellectuals and opinion leaders were too invested in the status quo to be brought about to a libertarian view, Rothbard pointed to David Duke and Joseph McCarthy as models for an outreach to the rednecks, which would fashion a broad libertarian, pale conservative coalition by targeting the disaffected and working middle classes. End quote. Of course, reason in its new incarnation as the official organ of the libertarian movement, movement's aging hipsters and would be cool kids vehemently opposes reaching out to middle and working class Americans, but is far too square for the black leather jacket wearing Nick Gillespie and his successor Matt Welch. Right wing populism, as far as the reason crowd is concerned, one might as well tout the appeal of right wing botulism. <laughs> Libertarianism, as understood, by the, as understood by the editors of Reason, is all about legalizing methamphetamine, having endless hookups, and giving mega corporations tax breaks so Reason can keep scarfing up those big corporate contributions. Be decidedly square, Dr. Paul, a 10 term Republican congressman from Texas, no less, and a pro life country doctor was and is anathema to team reason. Now, what would the smear bun do without David Duke? No smear campaign in America, at least, 
is complete without dragging him into it. No matter what, what the subject, the Iraq War, the Mirchheimer, and the Walt book, uh, if you take the politically incorrect position, according to the neocons, then you're marching shoulder to shoulder with the former Klansmen. Uh, and sure enough, the Kerchik piece takes up where reason leaves off, uh, yet uh, claiming that the Paul newsletter had kind words, quote unquote, for Duke. Yet if you go and read with me what the newsletter actually says about Duke, it is clear that the unknown author was merely saying Duke's success is due to his opposition to affirmative action in the welfare state. Indeed, Kirchhoff cites a passage without citing it in full, in which Duke is taken to task for his lack of a quote, consistent package of freedom. Yet the willfully ignorant Rackley Balco, another Cato employee, writes in reason, quote, I simply can't imagine seeing any piece of paper go out under my name that included synthetic words for David Duke. But a newsletter with Paul's name did just that, and that's an explanation. The explanation, which would be apparent if he actually cited what was written, is that these were not sympathetic words for Duke per se or for his political ambitions, but for the issues, legitimate issues, that he raised and exploited in his Louisiana campaign. After all, libertarians such as Paul reject affirmative action, racial set asides, and civil rights anti-discrimination ordinances, and all other forms of state-enforced special treatment for so-called minorities, precisely because they oppose racism and any form of collectivism. Uh, now, I, I don't have time to go into all the accusations, and there are many of them, in detail, but I just want to give you one example of the methodology of the smear book. Uh, and how they operate. And uh, in, in the Kirchhoff piece, uh, there were like bullet points, and they, and they lifted these sentences out of context. And here's, here's, here's one sentence that I'm quoting out of one point. Quote, our country is being destroyed by a group of actual and potential terrorists, and they can be identified by the color of their skin, end quote. Now, taken out of context, that's a horrific statement. But when we go to the source of this quote, what we have and what we find is a rather conventional conservative analysis of the Rodney King riots of 1992. The rioters are condemned, the, the Koreans are valorized, and the subject of black entitlement in its relation to the welfare state are delineated in no uncertain terms. Nothing, in short, that would be out of place in any conservative magazine. The above cited phrase of enemy being defined by, quote, the color of their skin, end quote, is here placed in its original context, an original paragraph. Regardless of what the media tell us, most white Americans are not going to believe that they are at fault for what blacks have done to cities across America. The professional blacks may have cowed the elites, but good sense survives at the grassroots. Many more are going to have difficulty avoiding the belief that our country is being destroyed by a group of actual and potential terrorists, they, and they can be identified by the color of their skin. This conclusion may not be entirely fair, but it is, for many, entirely unavoidable. Anymore. So that is quite a different kettle of fish than saying, it is probably very unfair to believe that, but you would never know that if you if your only source was Reason Magazine. Now, in context, the author was clearly saying that people will draw unfair conclusions, that racism will increase as a direct result of the Los Angeles riots. How exactly is that racist? If anything, it's a warning that the sociological consequences of status policies and the failure of the elites to address them will lead to the rise of the native dukes of this world if more responsible politicians don't face them head on. Another uh, phrase that was looked at context uh, 
Quote, only about 5% of Blacks have sensible political opinions. Quote, in context, it, it reads quite differently. Indeed, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Indeed, it is shocking to consider the uniformity of opinion among Blacks in this country. Opinion polls consistently show that only about 5% of Blacks have sensible political opinions, i.e. support the free market, individual liberty, and the end of welfare and affirmative action. I know many who fall into this group personally and may deserve credit, not as representatives of a racial group, but as decent people. How is that racist? The idea that people are not to be treated as representatives of racial groups is the antithesis of bigotry. But I mean, even pointing this out, this is this just. Uh, Kirchhoff also, and this is also titled by Reason Magazine, uh, they took Paul to task for questioning the idea that far from being one of America's greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln was one of the worst. This is another of Paul's hate crimes. Yet the idea that opposition to Lincoln idolatry is evidence of racism is absurd, as any serious person would immediately recognize. Is anyone really surprised that Paul doesn't idolize an American president who locked up his political opponents, repealed the writ of habeas corpus, and closed down newspapers? Give me a break. Kirchhoff is shocked, shocked by the idea that secession can be a legitimate means to achieve one's political objectives. He equates this with, quote, support for the Confederacy, unquote. But then one has to ask how the Soviet Empire imploded so quickly and relatively bloodlessly. Wasn't it because of individuals as well as the captive nations seceded from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? Tellingly, Kirchhoff, the New Republican punk, <laughs> pays tribute to his libertarian collaborators, averring, quote, the people surrounding the Von Mises Institute, including Paul, may describe themselves as libertarians, but they are nothing like the urbane libertarians who staff the Cato Institute or, or, or the libertines at Reason Magazine, end quote. They, of course, would never endorse the idea of secession, but of course they have endorsed the idea of secession. Vermont's secession is apparently okay but anything south of the Mason-Dixon line is not. You can't make this stuff up, folks. As evidence of Paul's alleged homophobia, another invented word, Kirchhoff whines that the newsletter writers term AIDS a politically protected disease, quote unquote. And yet that is the very same view held by the late Randy Schultz, a friend of mine, and an openly gay reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle, his famous book on the epidemic, and the point corresponds to it, and the band, and the band played on this title. Schiltz, uh, who, who died from AIDS in the 1980s, in his book describes at length how political correctness and fear of homophobia delayed the closing of the San Francisco bathhouses that were incubating the, the uh, epidemic and spreading the virus far and wide before the gay community began to wake up. Uh, uh, while the New Republic and Reason Magazine are perturbed by Paul's talk of, quote, an industrial banking political elite, end quote, any criticism of bankers and their federally insured con game is conspiracism and probably anti-Semitic too. When the banks get bailed out, us plebeians have better not complain um, on pain of facing Kirchhoff's wrath for also reasons. Worse, by Kirchhoffian standards, Paul is, quote, promoting his distrust of a federally regulated monetary system utilizing paper bills, end quote, a charge that seems slightly colorful, coming as it does during most during the most precipitous, I can say that word, decline of a currency since the phrase not worth the continental was coined. Now, Steve Saylor, the writer for Be Here and uh, the American conservative, uh, wrote the following. 
If a person cared about liberty, why would they be eager to mindlessly repeat smears about the most popular libertarian candidate in decades on the very day of the most crucial kingmaking primary in the United States? Now, this smear was published, uh, the printed article, on, on the eve of the national primary. So, but it's no mystery, really. Paul is, in many ways, in every way, the exact opposite of the Beltway and Cato interview fake libertarians. He's a populist. They suck up the power. He challenges the powers that be. They go along to get along. He has never gone along with the conventional wisdom as defined by the arbiters of political correctness, left and right. And most of all, he's the bad enemy of the neoconservatives, those former leftists turned rightists, whom he constantly names as the main danger of peace and liberty, while the Beltway's tame libertarians are in bed with them, often literally as well as figuratively. <laughs> in short, the Beltway fake lives are in bed with the state and all its works, while contenting themselves with the role of court jester and would-be reformers of the system. As long as they don't challenge anything too fundamental to the continuation of the welfare warfare state, the pet libertines of the neocon-led Republican coalition are being urbane and cosmopolitan, the highest compliment the Georgetown party circuit can bestow. Once they begin rocking the boat, as Paul insists on doing, they become fair game with smearable. How much time will I have? Another major reason for the antipathy to Paul coming from these quarters is his uncompromising opposition to U.S. foreign policy. A good half of the reason crowd were pro-war, some ambivalent, and a powerful minority in the Cato Institute rallied to the cause of liberating Iraq, or was at least sympathetic to the idea of exporting free market liberalism at gunpoint once the war would fail on plea. Reason itself took no position on the most important issue of the day, I'm told, because of the influence of big contributors. <laughs> the most shameful aspect of this episode is the active role played by the alleged libertarians in the smearing of Ron Paul. The reason Cato Lynch mob is really threatened by the existence of a mass libertarian movement, because it's a movement over which they have no control. They no longer get to define libertarianism to the general public, and, and more importantly, the media. Who needs them when we have a much more appealing and successful salesman for liberty? Besides, it's embarrassing for them, while they're begging our rulers to allow us just a little more freedom continually seek to trim the empire around uh, its rougher edges, Paul and the movement he spawned seek a much more radical application of libertarian principles, a consistent anti-statism on the home front, and a call to dismantle the empire before it dismantles the last vestiges of our whole republic. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.